Okay, so we are on lesson five of the winter quarter. The title of the lesson is Joy in Sorrow, Triumph in Tears. It goes over Psalms 42 to 57. And uh, uh, we'll look specifically at Psalm 42, Psalm 51, and then Psalm 57. So, Lord, we thank you. This is now book two of the Psalms that we've come to. We thank you for the Psalms. We thank you for the prayers that uh, mostly David wrote. Some others wrote some also. I see that Psalm 42, the sons of Korah wrote. But anyway, we thank you for the psalmists, and we thank you for their prayers, and we thank you that they still speak to us even now. And uh, they're very personal, and we thank thank you for those. So anyway, we pray that you would draw us close to you through these. In Jesus' name, amen. Oh, I made a mistake. We're not going through Psalm 42. We're going through Psalm 46. Psalm 46. So Psalm 42, verse 1, As the deer pants for the water brooks, so my soul pants for you, O God. And it is a very beautiful song. Also, and that's all we're going to say about that. And then we're skipping over Psalm 43, 44, and 45. Psalm 45 is a good psalm. Psalm 45, My heart overflows with a good theme. I address my verses to the king. My tongue is the pen of a ready writer. Writer, you are fairer than the sons of men. Grace is poured upon your lips, therefore God has blessed you forever. So it talks about the marriage of the king. And I wonder if it's the marriage of Jesus and us and the church. Um, because it sounds uh, messianic to me. Then Psalm 46, this is another good one. This is for the choir director, a psalm of the sons of Korah, set to Alamoth, a song. So the section A is called God is Our Refuge. That is Psalm 46, verses 1 through 11. I can start reading that one. God is our refuge and strength, a very present help in trouble. Therefore, we will not fear, though the earth should change and though the mountains slip into the heart of the sea, though its waters roar and foam, though the mountains quake at its swelling pride. There is a river whose streams make glad the city of God, the holy places of the Most High. God is in the midst of her. She will not be moved. God will help her when morning dawns. The nations made an uproar. The kingdoms tottered. He raised his voice. The earth melted. The Lord of hosts is with us. The God of Jacob is our stronghold. Come behold the works of the Lord who has wrought desolations in the earth. He makes wars to cease to the end of the earth. He breaks the bow and cuts the spear in two. He burns the chariots with fire. Cease striving, and know that I am God. I will be exalted among the nations. I will be exalted in the earth. The Lord of hosts is with us. The God of Jacob is our stronghold. Okay. So, what does that stir up in you? Yeah, do, do we get afraid sometimes? Yeah, we tend to. So, when we get afraid, we should read the psalm. So verses 1 through 3, God is our refuge and strength, a very present help in trouble. God is our refuge. And notice that he is abundantly available for help. He's a very present help in trouble for little things and for big things. So you just seek him and, and he's there. And so the corollary to that is verse 2, Therefore we will not fear, though the earth should change. You know, if I didn't know, if I wasn't looking forward to what the Lord has for us, I would be fearful. 
with the way things are now, the way things are in our country, the way things are in our state, and uh, the way things are with in relation to Israel, where everyone is anti-Semitic, you know, the <laughs> whole world is anti-Semitic, you know, because that makes God upset when you're anti-Semitic. Israel has a promise that those who curse them will be cursed. And so I don't think that bodes well for us in our country. But, you know, we have the hope of what is coming afterwards. And so so we don't have to fear. And the psalmist says we don't have to fear even in an earthquake, which is described here, though the earth should change and the mountains slip into the heart of the sea. So what would you say are your greatest fears? Or maybe you don't have any fears. Yeah, so yeah, so the degradation of the school system. Yeah. Yeah, it's been gradually happening, you know, for many years. No, since COVID, it's gone on hyperdrive, it seems like. You know, Everything. yeah, so that makes you a little nervous. So, how can God help you cope with this? Yeah. Right, we're to, it's a command, really, yeah. not to fear. We're you know, it's not a suggestion, uh, but He gives us ample reason not to fear, and then we also have a method to help us, and that's Philippians 4, verses 6 and 7, which everyone knows. But be anxious for nothing, but in everything, by prayer and supplication, with thanksgiving, let your requests be made known to God, and the peace of God, which surpasses all comprehension, will guard your hearts and your minds in Christ Jesus. So when you're concerned, and you know, I'm glad I don't have school-aged children anymore to have to deal with this, you know, I think, I mean, I personally think homeschooling is the only way to go now. Even the uh, even the private schools are infiltrated with this stuff, you know. Even the Christian schools are infiltrated with this. Yeah, the Christian churches are infiltrated with wokeness. You have to be very careful what church you attend. Yeah, they're they're falling away from the scripture, and uh, so that's that's a bad situation. Um. But we can pray, and when we see these things happening, we know that the Lord is getting ready to take us home, which we look forward to. So then in verse 4 of Psalm 46, There is a river whose streams make glad the city of God, the holy dwelling places of the Most High. And the quarterly talked about this a little bit. You know, in the millennial city of Jerusalem, there will be a river that comes out of the temple, comes out of the right side of the altar. And uh, the uh, quarterly, though, related it to something Jesus said in John 7, which I, I think could apply to that also. And that is John chapter 7, verse 37. And Jesus, this is a, Jesus was in Jerusalem at a feast. And I think, I'm not remembering which feast this was that he was at. Oh, the Feast of Booths. It was the Feast of Tabernacles. He was there for the Feast of Tabernacles. And he said, Now on the last day, the great day of the feast, Jesus stood and cried out, saying, If anyone is thirsty, let him come to me and drink. He who believes in me, as the scripture has said, from his innermost being will flow rivers of living water. By this he spoke of the Spirit, whom those who believed in him were to receive, for the Spirit was not yet given, because Jesus was not yet glorified. And uh, the Holy Spirit is given. Uh, specifically to the church, you know, the Holy Spirit came upon people in the Old Testament too. But all of church members are indwelt 
by the Holy Spirit, which is this rivers of living water, Jesus called it. And so the quarterly um, talked about the Holy Spirit as relating to this verse 4, a river whose streams make glad the city of God. And of course, that doesn't relate specifically to Jerusalem, which this river coming out of the temple in the millennium relates specifically to Jerusalem. And that will make the Dead Sea um, a freshwater lake, and fish will live in it again. So then verses 5 through 7, God is in the midst of her. She will not be moved. God will help her when morning dawns. That verse reminds me of the Lord of the Rings. You ever see the Lord of the Rings? Oh, you haven't? Oh, well, that, that movie is getting to be it's over 20 years old now. But there's a, uh, there's a scene where... Rohan, which is a, a nation in Middle Earth, is under siege by all the orcs, and it's and Gandalf says, you know, look to the east on the third day at morning or something like that, and they were getting trounced and they were almost going to be over overtaken, and on the morning, on that morning, they came to the rescue. Had people come to the rescue and save them, and of course they defeated the bad guys. So that's what this makes me think of. God is in the midst of her; she will not be moved. God will help her when morning dawns. You know, there's a saying that it's always darkest just before the dawn, and that makes me think of the times in which we're living. They're dark; they're getting darker. You know. All the predictions for next year are not better, but worse that I have seen from the secular press, um, economic, economically, people are saying it, it's you know, watch out and stuff like that. But eventually, the morning will dawn. So that's what we have to hang on to. We're on Psalm forty-six. So the nations made an uproar, the kingdoms tottered, he raised his voice, the earth melted. That sounds like when Jesus comes back. The Lord of hosts is with us, the God of Jacob is our stronghold. So even no matter what's going on at the time, that is, that is always true. Um, and there will be a physical rescue, specifically for the Jews, in the tribulation period, the morning will dawn, and he will come get them after seven years of darkness. But the morning will come for us earlier at the rapture. Then verses 8 through 11, Come behold the works of the Lord who has wrought desolations in the earth. So, you know, when calamity hits, the Lord is not doesn't take him by surprise. He brings calamity. And uh, because the world is sinful, and so he gives them what they deserve. Sometimes, most of the time he doesn't. Most of the time he's very gracious and does not give people what they deserve. But anyway, verse 9, he makes wars to cease to the end of the earth. So that hasn't happened yet, has it? Now we have what Israel has going on three fronts of wars all around her. He breaks the bow and cuts the spear in two. He burns the chariots with fire. So that will come in the millennium, right? In the millennium, gee, there will be a war. The end of the tribulation, it will be short-lived war. Jesus will conquer all the armies of the earth. And then he will start peace, a peaceful reign of righteousness and justice, and it will last for 1,000 years, and then there will be another war at the end of that, which will last, which will last even shorter. 
and fire will come down from heaven and stop that war, and then we will be in an eternal state of peace. So cease striving and know that I am God. I will be, that's in the future tense, exalted among the nations. I will be exalted in the earth, and that will happen again in the millennial kingdom, which we're eagerly waiting for and which we pray for. So when things are bad, you can go to God. He is our refuge. And he will help us, even though he might not change the external circumstances immediately. He will change our attitude about it. And um, he does that to me frequently. I don't know about you, but I'm, you know, I'm pretty easily shaken, but the Lord settles me pretty quickly. So any more about that section? All right. So we're going to move on to a plea for forgiveness, and that is Psalm 51. So we went over Psalm 47. Psalm 48, these are Psalms of the sons of Korah. Psalm 49, I'm looking to see. I didn't go through and see if there was any good verses. You know, the since uh, the end of October, the stock market has done great. But that can change on a dime and crash in a, in a second. Psalm 49.5 says, Why should I fear in days of adversity when the iniquity of my foes surround me? This is what you're talking about, isn't it, Witty? Even those who trust in their wealth and boast in the abundance of their riches, no man can by any means redeem his brother or give to God a ransom for him. It doesn't matter how much money you have. For the redemption of his soul is costly, and he should cease trying forever. That he should live on eternally, that he should not undergo decay. So, Jesus paid the price. The price is not in coin, it's in blood. And it's in the blood of God. So verse 15 of that same psalm says, But God will redeem my soul from the power of Sheol, for he will receive me. And he does that because Jesus paid in blood. Then there is Psalm 50. Let's see, what can we say about that? Psalm 50? Uh, 50. I'm, I'm just scanning now. Psalm 50 is a psalm of Asaph. Mm -hmm. Yeah, God, God does have rituals he wants us to go through, like the Lord's Supper. That's a, a ritual, but the, he wants us to think about what we're doing. And the point of the Lord's Supper is to remember what Jesus did 2,000 years ago, uh, because we are forgetful uh, people. And the Jews under the Mosaic Law had a lot of rituals that the Lord had prescribed, but it was to make them uh, think about things, and the Lord didn't like it when they did the rituals, but didn't do the underlying, what he desired underlying that, which was to follow his law. Okay, so we're to Psalm 51. That is section B, a plea for forgiveness. And this is entitled, For the Choir Director, A Psalm of David, When Nathan the Prophet Came to Him After He Had Gone Into Bathsheba. Now, this is a public psalm. It is in the Psalter. It is written down. But look at what is written at the top. David's adultery with Bathsheba is broadcasted <laughs> to the world <laughs> for all time. How would you like that? You know? Most people want to hide stuff like that. So, but, you know, even now, 2,000 years later, no, 3,000 years later, because Dave was a, David was a 1,000 years before Christ, we know what David did. 
and Bathsheba did. So anyway, does somebody want to read verses 1 through 9 of Psalm 51? Okay, thank you. Yeah, so this um, this is David who is repenting, or confessing really, his sin which is spelled out in Second Samuel 11. So Second Samuel 11, remember it's... Going, leading up to 2 Samuel 11 was um, the first part of 2 Samuel is really a, a catalog of David's victories. And he had a lot of victories. You know, he was, he became king in Hebron, and then he was made king over all of Israel. And then chapter 8 is a list of military victories where he was spectacularly successful. And um, so he had success. He had success. And what happens when you have success? It tends to go to your head. Yeah. So success is a danger to a child of God. Um, because humility is prized by the Lord. And success tends to do away with humility. And then you think you're above it all when you're, you know, have a lot of success. And so in Second Samuel 11, verses 1 and 2, it says, Then it happened in the spring at the time when kings go out to battle that David sent Joab and his servants with him and all Israel, and they destroyed the sons of Ammon and besieged Rabbah, but David stayed at Jerusalem. He said, you guys got this. Now when evening came, David arose from his bed and walked around on the roof of the king's house, and from the roof he saw a woman bathing, and the woman was very beautiful in appearance. So he saw, he was able apparently to look down on the bathtub of Bathsheba, and she was naked, taking a bath. And he thought she looked she looked good. So, and that made him think things. Okay, this is what happens when people look at pornography. You know, they didn't have pornography back then per se. But he's seeing someone else's wife in a way that he shouldn't see her. And it makes you think things, which are sinful. Well, I don't know that. <laughs> I don't know that if he was looking through a window or or how how that worked. I don't know the details of that. I don't think that she was doing this purposefully, but he was, or he did. And uh, so then, verses four and five. So he sent messengers to her. So she was the king, or he was the king, and he sent someone to get her. And and she went, and and they had a one night stand, and you know, of course, I I don't know how willing she was to do this or not. It doesn't say that she fought him at all, and you know, she did it. Her husband was away at the war. And so then she sends a message that she is now pregnant. And so King David does not confess his sin yet. First, there's the cover-up. you got to do the cover-up, which makes it interesting to me that Psalm 51 is broadcasting this sin <laughs> 3,000 years later to the whole world. <laughs> You know, that is the most failed cover-up we have ever seen. <laughs> yeah, so uh, so he sends to have Uriah come, and he tries to send Uriah to his home so that he would have sex with his own wife and the baby would be thought to be his. And Uriah doesn't think that's right that the army is out in the field, and he's in the army, and yet he's back at home, and so he's not going to go home. 
he's going to, he stays around the palace. And uh, even though David tries to get him drunk, or he does get him drunk, so he encourages sin again in Uriah with drunkenness. And Uriah still won't go home, and so he sends a message to Joab. Joab, sin didn't bother Joab too much, especially killing people. That didn't bother Joab. And so he said, put him right in the midst of the worst fire, uh, firefight and then abandon him. And that's what happened. And so that was conspiracy to commit murder and murder. And then he didn't do anything for a little while. And then, after the wife mourned, he proposed to her and brought her into the palace, and she became part of his harem. Because he already had mul multiple wives already. So that is the historical account. And uh, here he says, Be gracious to me, O God, according to your loving kindness. Now, if you're, if David is coming to you, are you going to be gracious to him after all that? We we wouldn't want to be gracious to him, would we? We wouldn't want to be gracious to somebody who did that. We would want them to get what they deserve. It says, according to the greatness of your compassion, blot out my transgressions. Okay, so. You know, the Lord is gracious, and if you confess sin, he will forgive that sin. There's only one sin the Lord will not forgive. The Lord commands people to trust in Jesus. And if they do sin by refusing that command, that will not be forgiven. And then the pile of sins that they have accumulated through their lives will fall on them the punishment for it. But he will, every other sin, including murder, including adultery, including lying, including soliciting drunkenness in someone else, you know, by deceit, um, he will forgive all of those things. Well, yeah, I mean, the Lord gives you a whole lifetime to change your mind. All you have to do is change your mind at one point in your life and trust in Jesus and you're saved. And, uh, you know, after that, you have the Holy Spirit, and the Holy Spirit continues to work in you right. to change your, act, your, your behavior. So it's more like Jesus. But whether if you change your behavior or not, you're saved. Um, because that's Jesus' promise. And that's the only requirement he makes of us. And, every, you know, every other sin he will forgive based on that one act of faith. And David had trusted in God based on the coming Messiah. So he says that he knows his transgressions in verse 3, and my sin is ever before me. So, you know, when you don't confess sin, it weighs on you, and you can't stop thinking about it. And you know that God does not like sin, and God will punish sin. And you you can't get it out of your mind. Yeah, every person's most important need is to have sins cleansed. And that is something we don't think about as a need. We think of our physical needs, you know, and things like that. We don't really think that often that we need to be cleansed from sin. Uh, but we do. And, that, you know, that's why that's part of the Lord's Prayer. That's something we need to have done regularly. And then verse 4, Against you, you only, I have sinned and done what is evil in your sight, so that you are justified when you speak and blameless when you judge. Yeah, so in, in verse 4, Against you, you only, I have sinned and done what is evil in your sight, so that you're justified when you speak and blameless when you judge. Now, he's saying that he's, his sin was against God only. Does sin harm people other than God? 
Does sin harm other people when you sin? It does. Yeah, sin harms everybody around you. Sin harms everybody around you, but ultimately it is always against God, and it is something His Holiness cannot tolerate. Um, his Holiness will not allow him to let it pass. Otherwise, he wouldn't be holy. So he cannot overlook it. He can't. It is against his nature. He must punish sin. And uh, But sin harms everybody around you. You know, it will, it will ruin all of your relationships, you know. It will influence children. If you have children, it will influence them in a negative way. Everyone around you is harmed by sin. But ultimately, it is against God, and he is the one who will bring the punishment. And that's one thing about sin. The Lord will forgive every sin, he will not necessarily take away the consequences of the sin, you know, and so you have to live with that. And David learned that, you know, the Nathan who brought his sin to light to him so that he kind of forced him to confess it. You know, the Mosaic law prescribed death for, the, for two of these sins, uh, for adultery. The penalty was death. For murder, the penalty was death. And the Lord did not kill him. Uh, and that, you know, was his, the Lord's prerogative not to bring that sin. Um, but that just goes to show you that if you confess your sin, the penalty will be lightened, tends to be lightened. And... Uh, but he did have chaos in his family after that, and that's what was prophesied, what Nathan prophesied, and that his sons would fight for the throne after him and would kill each other, and the sword would not leave his house anymore. So there would be members of his family killing each other, and his family life became unhappy. Uh, after this. So then, verse 5, Behold, I was brought forth in iniquity, and in sin my mother conceived me. So what does that mean? His mother was married to Jesse. She had seven kids. So they were affectionate. They were an affectionate set of parents. Now that talks about original sin. Um, when we are born, we are born with a sin nature, and within 20 minutes we have sinned <laughs> from the time of our birth. <laughs> you know? um, and let's see, and that's in Genesis chapter 5 and verse 1. Remember, Adam was made in the image of God. Adam was made directly, and Eve was made directly by God. And everyone after that was made by reproduction, because the Lord made the first two humans able to reproduce. And Genesis 5 says this, This is the book of the generations of Adam. In the day when God created man, he made him in the likeness of God. He created them male and female, and he blessed them and named them man in the day when they were created. When Adam had lived 130 years, he became the father of a son in his own likeness, according to his image, and named him Seth. It's no longer exactly in the likeness of God, because now, this is after Adam had fallen. Okay, and so he had a sin nature, and he was disconnected from God spiritually uh, when he sinned. And so his children were born that way, disconnected from God at birth. And that is why physical death 
was part of our existence after that. Because spiritual death leads to physical death. And that is why we die now, because of original sin. That's why we wear out. I think the law of entropy was introduced at the fall. That's my thought about that. And that's why we need a Savior. That's why everyone needs a Savior. Because that is the only thing that will take away that sin. The uh, sacrifices of the animals would atone for the sin. They would cover the sin until the next time it was required. But they wouldn't take it away. Jesus' sacrifice takes the sin away. You know, if you put your trust in him. So verse 6, Behold, you desire truth in the innermost being, and in the hidden part you will make me know wisdom. So God desires truth. He knows when you sin, because he's in your head. He sees on the outside, everyone, because he's omnipresent, and he also can read your mind. <laughs> so he knows when you're thinking about sin, before you do it. Um, you know, that's what happened to Cain. Cain was thinking about sin, and the Lord said, don't do it. You know, don't let sin control you. And he, Cain, of course, ignored him and did it anyway. So we want to have uh, be careful about what we put in our mind and what you let sit in there, yeah, because what you think eventually will lead to action. And if you think about sinful things, then it will lead to sinful actions. So, but God desires truth in the innermost being. So basically, the Lord just wants us to agree that, yes, what you, you know, if you've sinned, that you admit it. He wants you to admit it, you know. And that is how he will forgive you. If you won't admit it, he will not forgive you. You have to admit it. And that's First John 1, 9. Verse 7, Purify me with hyssop, and I shall be clean. Wash me, and I shall be whiter than snow. So David is asking God to cleanse him. Notice he's not saying, I will cleanse myself. You cannot cleanse yourself from sin. It's like the cat in the hat. I don't know if anybody's read the cat in the hat recently. The cat in the hat had this green, this uh, pink spot that he was trying to get rid of. And he trying to clean it with all sorts of different things. And <laughs> all he did was spread the spot until everything was pink. That's what sin is like when you try to clean it yourself. You can't, it doesn't clean. It just multiplies and spreads. Um, it can be cleansed by God, and that's who we have to go to to cleanse it. And it took a lot for God to clean it. It took God to become incarnate. He lived a perfect life. He died on a cross. He shed his blood. And based on that, uh, you can be clean. So when you're forgiven from sin, how does that make you feel? Yeah, you feel guilty, and when you're forgiven, you feel so much better. Thank yeah, thank and thankful, right? So verse 8 says, Make me to hear joy and gladness. Let the bones which you have broken rejoice. So yeah, when you are forgiven from sin, and that's why we want to have short accounts with the Lord. When we recognize that we sin, most commonly, in my case, is because I talk too fast and say things before thinking about it. And so I hurt people with the way I speak. Um, that's the most common way I sin nowadays. <laughs> and so I have to be careful and before I speak, and to, before I say anything. 
But anyway, and you, you just have to confess it when you do it. Verse 9, hide your face from my sins and blot out all my iniquities. So when the Lord forgives your sin based on what Jesus has done, it's as though you hadn't sinned. He takes it away, as far as the east is from the west. Okay, now he may leave the results of the sin for you to deal with. So verse 10, create in me a clean heart, O God, and renew a steadfast spirit within me. I think that's talking about our new nature. You know, our new nature does not sin. So the Lord gives us a new nature, and our new nature partakes of his nature as a church-age believer, and that is what we were memorizing in November. 2 Peter 1 4. 2 Peter 1 4 says, For by these we have been granted his precious and magnificent promises, so that by them you may become partakers of the divine nature, having escaped the corruption that is in the world by lust. And so um, that is what is available to us. As church-age believers, we're indwelt by the Holy Spirit. We can partake of the divine nature. So I'll read uh, verses uh, 10 through 19. I already read verse 10. Do not cast me away from your presence, and do not take your Holy Spirit from me. Restore to me the joy of your salvation, and sustain me with a willing spirit. Then I will teach transgressors your ways, and sinners will be converted to you. Deliver me from blood guiltiness, O God. Remember, he committed murder. The God of my salvation, then my tongue will joyfully sing of your righteousness. O Lord, open my lips that my mouth may declare your praise. For you do not delight in sacrifice, otherwise I would give it. You are not pleased with burnt offering. The sacrifices of God are a broken spirit. A broken and a contrite heart, O God, you will not despise. By your favor do good to Zion. Build the walls of Jerusalem. Then you will delight in righteous sacrifices, in burnt offering and whole burnt offering. Then young bulls will be offered on your altar. So, in verse 11, the Holy Spirit is the engine of permanent change and spiritual growth. Do not take your Holy Spirit from me. In the Old Testament, Holy Spirit could be taken from someone. Not every believer had the Holy Spirit, but in our age we do. And then verse 13, look at this. Then I will teach transgressors your ways, and sinners will be converted to you, so you can help others come out of sin. Okay. Yeah, that's a fancy word for murder. Fancy word. Yeah, blood so guiltiness. Can yeah, yeah. One of the proverbs says that uh, the debt for murder should never be erased. So what God did there was remarkable yes. to forgive him of murder. Yes. Um, he should have been killed, you know, and but the Lord forgave him. And um, God is in control of all the shitheads. That is what the Mosaic Law called for. And, uh, you know, the proverb reiterated that. That's Proverbs twenty-eight seventeen. So verse 16, sacrifice is called for under the Mosaic Law, but if you do it without changing your mind about that your sin is wrong, the Lord will not honor it. It has to be done with a contrite heart. Okay, I'm just going to read the last psalm. <laughs> no. <laughs> I, I think it's not going to, you know, yeah, oh well. So Psalm 57 says, For the choir director said to Al Tesheth, which means do not destroy, a MGTAM of David when he fled from Saul in the cave. There are several psalms David wrote from the cave, this cave in Adullam. 
Be gracious to me, O God, be gracious to me, for my soul takes refuge in you, and in the shadow of your wings I will take refuge until destruction passes by. I will cry to God Most High, who, to God who accomplishes all things for me. He will send from heaven and save me. He reproaches him who tramples upon me. God will send forth his loving kindness and his truth. My soul is among lions, I must lie among those who breathe forth fire, even the sons of men whose teeth are spears and arrows and their tongue a sharp sword. Be exalted above the heavens, O God, let your glory be above all the earth. They have prepared a net for my steps, my soul is bowed down, they dug a pit before me, they themselves have fallen into the midst of it. My heart is steadfast, O God, my heart is steadfast. I will sing, yes, I will sing praises. Awake, my glory, awake, harp and lyre, I will awaken the dawn. I will give thanks to you, O Lord, among the peoples. I will sing praises to you among the nations. For your loving kindness is great to the heavens and your truth to the clouds. Be exalted above the heavens, O God. Let your glory be above all the earth. So, Lord, we thank you for these psalms. They're, they're very penetrating to us. They speak to our soul, and uh, we thank you for that. And help us to be willing to confess our sin quickly when we recognize that we have it so that we might have your forgiveness. In Jesus' name, amen.